I'm going to be giving a talk on artificial intelligence and fiction, uh, but not uh, AI that appears in fiction, but instead uh, AI that writes fiction uh, and look at the consequences of AI written fiction for various theories in the philosophy of fiction, both in the difference between fiction and nonfiction, as well as uh, accounts of what it means for something to be true in a fiction. Now, I'll start off with this passage here. Uh, this is a passage from a book called One the Road. Uh, and it says, the time was seven minutes after one o'clock in the afternoon. The policeman was standing in front of the station and reading a novel on the beach. So this passage was written by an artificial intelligence, uh, which may be why it strike, might strike, strike you as a little bit weird. Uh, the policeman is on the beach, but also in front of the police station. Uh, uncommon place for a police station to be, perhaps. Um, but the way this works is uh, Ross Goodwin put a camera on top of his car and microphones inside the car and then went on a road trip with his friends. And the data from the camera and the microphones was fed into a neural network that then produced this book. And it was two neural networks, a uh, convolutional neural network and a uh, recurrent neural network uh, that formed the... Uh, the program he wrote. And uh, it mostly reads like poetry. The corpus of texts he used to train the, the AI were mostly poetry. Um, and there's no overarching narrative or anything. But you get sort of the flashes of what could be fiction in there. Uh, and it's not the only one. Uh, there's a number of books written by AI. Um, there, in addition to One the Road, there's Dinner Depression, which is completely written by an AI. And a day the computer wrote a novel, which is uh, AI generated text, but curated by humans. So we're not currently at a point where AIs can say pass a relevant Turing test for fiction writing. Uh, you can't produce a whole novel, you know, that would pass for a human written novel. But it's not, you know, science fiction that someday we will have AI written novels. So uh, what I want to explore is once we have these AI written novels, what does that mean for uh, current theories of fiction in philosophy? Um, I guess one, one more point on, on progress towards uh, AI written fiction. Uh, generative adversarial networks have been particularly effective at uh, uh, visual art, um, and they're starting to be pretty effective at text generation. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're, we're certainly moving in the direction of uh, AI fiction. Now, a lot of the theories in the philosophy of fiction uh, put a special place for authors' intentions. Uh, they often require that the author perform some kind of imaginative action in order for the, the text to count as fiction. So our first question is whether or not these potential fiction writing AIs have intentions and can perform imaginative acts. And I'll argue that no, you, you don't need that in order to get um, an AI that can write passable fiction or pass a relevant Turing test for fiction writing. Um, you know, every bit of the, the neural networks that say Ross Goodwin put together for One the Road were devoted towards the action of choosing the next letter or word to appear in the text. Uh, but that's different than what happens in our brain when we're writing. Um, obviously part of your brain is firing away, picking words, typing those words out, but parts of it are focused on, you know, paying attention to what's going on and, and having the, the phenomenology, the feelings of coming up with ideas. Um, so uh, that's what sets our writing task apart from the AI's writing task is it's entirely, you know, the, these programs are made entirely for the purpose of putting together words, whereas our brains are not. Now, it's not to say that you couldn't have an AI in the future that's doing some imaginative task and actually has the phenomenology of it, perhaps. Uh, but that's a question for the philosophy of mind and depends on which theories of philosophy of mind you think might be correct. Um, but we don't need our AIs to be conscious, to have feelings of what it's like before they can write passable fiction, fiction that could pass as human written fiction. So the, the next question then is, you know, if we have these AI written texts and they were written without intentions or imaginative acts, 
Um, some people might say, well, then they don't count as fiction because that's a necessary condition for fiction. So I'm going to argue that, in fact, we should take these AI written texts in the future to count as fiction. Uh, now, our definition of fiction in the context of philosophy shouldn't stray too far away from our ordinary usage of the term. Um, so when an AI written novel becomes commonplace and you know they're being sold in bookstores, uh, they're likely to appear on the fiction shelves because when people go into the bookstore and they're looking for a particular kind of text, if the AI written text matches what the readers are looking for, they'll find it in the sections of the bookstore that have those kinds of texts. Um, AI written texts might entertain people in the same ways that human written fiction does. And so the readers will treat them as fiction. So if we say that AI written texts fail to be fiction, because of the lack of intentions, then our philosophical meaning of the word fiction will become more distant from the ordinary usage of the term. And there's some support for saying that, hey, the, we don't need intentions for art, um, or at least our normal usage of words like art don't require intentions. Uh, so some research has been done on folk intuitions about categories like art when it comes to AI generated art. And they found that people are willing to attribute the title art to AI created paintings. Now, this is assuming that the, the, the uh, viewer doesn't treat the painting as the result of an accident. So if it's, uh, if they think, oh, it's just random accidents, we're not gonna count it as art. But generally people are willing to say that the AI doesn't produce its art by accident. You know, it's, it was created by its programmers for the purpose of creating art. And, its artwork might look like the paintings of some famous master. And so they don't treat it like an accident. And so they're willing to generally give the title art to these paintings. Uh, they're not willing to call the AI an artist though. Uh, so this seems to show that intentions are not necessary for art, but they may be necessary for the title of artist. And applying this to fiction, we might say, well, intentions are not necessary for something to count as fiction because, you know, we're going to be buying it in the fiction section of the bookstore. Um, but uh, in order to be a, an author of fiction or the kind of artist that produces, produces fiction, AI won't, won't make it. You would need intentions for that. So the folk intuition seems to support that once we get AI to the point that it can write passable fictions, then those should, in fact, count as fiction. So if we've got these AI written fictions that were produced without intentions, then what does that say for various theories on the difference between fiction and nonfiction? And the first one I'm going to look at is John Searle's uh, pretense theory. Uh, according to Searle, one necessary condition for a work to be fiction is that the author is pretending to assert the propositions in the text. Uh, in nonfiction, they're actually asserting those propositions. But in fiction, they just pretend to do so. Um, but according to Searle, you can't pretend without intending to pretend. And, and there's going to be a problem for the pretense theory dealing with AI written fictions. If we have fictions written by AI, then the AI isn't intending to pretend anything when it writes that fiction, because it can't intend. Uh, and so we would have a fiction without any pretending to assert anything. And that would undermine Searle's view. Uh, now, there's other problems with Searle's uh, theory here. Uh, for example, um, certain works in historical fiction. Uh, can we not draw on the slides, please? Um, so uh, some works of historical fiction may be made up primarily of actual assertions and not just pretended assertions. Uh, another view, uh, Curry's, uh, Gregory Curry's view. Um, second. So Gregory Curry's view uh, defines the difference between fiction and nonfiction uh, in terms of the kind of utterance made by the author. So uh, in fiction, the author is making a fictive utterance. They are inviting the reader to make believe the proposition that they utter. But in nonfiction, they're inviting the reader to believe that proposition. So um, the, the difference between these fictive utterances and non-fictive utterances 
can't come down to the content of the utterance. So the sentences that they utter, because those sentences might have the same words in them. Um, they might have the same meanings. It's just uh, the intentions of the utterer make the difference between whether they're making a fictive utterance or a non-fictive one. Because the same words could be used to invite a reader to make believe as they are to invite the reader to believe. And so since the difference here comes down to the intentions of the author uh, and the AI lack intentions, uh, we can't use fictive versus non-fictive utterances to make the difference between fiction and non-fiction when the text was generated by an AI. Now, Curry's theory might work fine for human written texts, um, but it's not going to work in the case of AI. So it's not going to give us a general theory of the difference between fiction and nonfiction. He would need some addition on there uh, for the uh, um, for AI generated texts. Uh, and perhaps we might think, well, it, uh, if we can have a general theory rather than one that has to make differences based off the kind of author, uh, maybe the more general one would, would be a better choice. Now, one theory that gained some vindication from AI authored fiction would be Kendall Walton's. According to Walton, a work of fiction is a prop in a game of make-believe of a certain sort, a game played by appreciators. And then fiction making is merely the activity of constructing such props. Now, the important part for, for Walton is that these props could form naturally. You might say, well, a stump can be a prop for a game of make-believe played by children, where they imagine that the stump is some you know, mythological creature or something. Um, now, an AI could produce props for games of make-believe. Uh, and so we don't need the AI to intend to create that prop. It just, it just does it. Um, you might liken this to playing a game of chess against an AI. And, you know, you're playing a game of make-believe where uh, the, some, some mathematical function generates the props for the game, and, and, and those props prompt you to, to make moves in the game of make-believe. Uh, same thing in a game of chess. Stockfish uh, might make some move uh, that prompts you to, to reply, but that move was just generated by some mathematical function rather than by some intention. So Walton actually has a pretty pretty good position because he doesn't rely on the intentions of the author uh, for defining what fiction is. Now, uh, philosophy of fiction goes beyond just the difference between fiction and nonfiction. We also talk about what does it mean for a sentence to be true in a fiction, and uh, authors play a pretty pivotal role in those discussions, because generally we think authors have authority when it comes to uh, determining what's true and false in their fictions. Uh, J.K. Rowling, for example, likes to, to make additions to her, her canon, um, even when it's, she's doing it outside of the actual text of the novels. And we generally think, yeah, maybe she does have the, the right to do that, being the author. So uh, first off, uh, going back to Gregory Curry, his um, view on the difference between fiction and nonfiction struggles to handle AI written fiction, but his theory of truth in fiction might actually um, handle a little bit better. And for Curry, uh, what makes it true, a, a sentence true in a fiction is that an informed reader would infer that the fictional author of that fiction would believe the proposition. Um, now, the, the important part here for Curry is he can get away from the intentions of the actual author, uh, because the fictional author is not the actual author, and they're not the narrator of the story either. So the Curry thinks when you're reading a work of fiction, you're, you're playing a game of make-believe, and inside of that game, there is this fictional author, and the fictional author is the one who tells you the story as known fact. So imagine you're reading a book that has a narrator. Um, the narrator is not the fictional author. The fictional author is telling you that the narrator is telling you the story and the contents of the story told by the narrator. Um, and so the it, it gets away from, from the intentions of the actual author since the fictional author is informed by the informed reader. So, so what counts as the fictional author and what the fictional author would believe is in part determined by what the informed reader should be inferring. Um, 
so the problem here is going to come up with who counts as an informed reader of AI written fiction. So normally you're going to figure out who your informed reader is based on, you know, they're, they're going to have basic knowledge of like accepted facts within the community of the author. They're going to know the author's writing style, perhaps, or the, the author's place within the literary tradition. But it's much harder to figure out what these are going to be in the case of an AI that writes fiction. Uh, so the AI didn't grow up in some community. It, it wasn't influenced through an entire life. Uh, by events that happen within that community, uh, doesn't, you know, say it might not even know the general beliefs of the people around it when it was created. Um, it is going to be positioned within a literary tradition, though, because if you the corpus of text that you use to train the AI uh, will include works of literature, most likely, and th those works of literature will position the AI within some element of literary tradition. Um, in the same way, you, know, you generate a painting uh, to try to match the kinds of paintings of some, some master artist in the past uh, is going to position that AI within some tradition of, of visual art. Now, uh, that would mean maybe the programmer has a claim to be an informed reader because they, they know the, the text that went into the corpus. Um, but it's, it's not going to be clear exactly how those texts influenced the training of the AI. Uh, so unless we can explain what's going on with our AI, it might be hard for us to say that we're, we're an informed reader of the, of the books it creates. So it's not impossible. It just might support a skepticism about what is true or false in an AI written fiction. It might be hard to tell. Uh, and that brings us to the, the last uh, view I'm going to talk about here, and that is uh, David Lewis's view of truth and fiction. Uh, so according to Lewis, the way we figure out what's true in a fiction uh, is uh, we're going to check uh, collective belief worlds. Um, so uh, a collective belief world is generated off of the community of origin of the text. And so we check to see for, you know, take that community, find the beliefs that they all share, and then they, they all know that the other people share. And then use that to get a possible world. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to check worlds where the, the story of the fiction is told as known fact. And we want to know whether or not a given proposition is true or false in that world. And uh, the way we, we figure out um, whether or not the, the sentence is true in the fiction itself is by going to those worlds where phi is true and checking to see if they're closer to the collective belief worlds than the, the worlds where not phi is true. Now, the, the issue here um, for Lewis, it, it's not going to come from directly from the intentions of the author because he doesn't have a place for them in this. Uh, at least not, not as clearly as um, other accounts of truth and fiction. Um, but we need to know exactly what counts as a collective belief world. And at that point, the intentions come in. So uh, the proper background then consists of the beliefs that generally prevailed in the community where the fiction originated, the beliefs of the author and his intended audience. And that intended audience there is where uh, the problems will start coming out. So in order to get the collective belief worlds, we need to know something about the intended audience of the, of the author. But the AI itself doesn't have an intended audience. Um, so we need to find some other source for that intended audience. And I've got a couple suggestions here. And the first one is maybe the programmers have an intended audience for the fictions that are generated by their AI. Um, like maybe they, they have a planned market for the books uh, that they're generating. So they they built the corpus in just a way that they think they'll get the kinds of novels that will sell well to this particular community. Uh, but that won't take care of every case because you might have programmers who don't have any particular audience in mind when they made their AI. Uh, they're, they're just trying to make fiction. They don't care what kind comes out. Uh, another option might be the language community of the corpus. So we've got a whole bunch of texts in here and we want to uh, take the, you know, maybe they're all in English, say. And so we, we say, okay, the intended audience is English speakers because any fiction that's generated by this, this AI is going to be in English. Um, but that group is too broad 
And so a lot of basic facts are going to come out neither true nor false in that fictional world because uh, there's not a whole lot of things that all of us agree on and uh, know that the other people believe. Uh, and then the last option I look at is um, that uh, we look at the, the communities of the authors of the text that go into the corpus. So, um, or, or perhaps even the intended audiences of the authors whose texts are in the corpus. Uh, so imagine that you train your AI entirely on Victorian fi uh, fiction. Um, and so maybe your, your audience is people living in Victorian England. And so uh, that gives us a, a closer match because, you know, a, a, it might turn out that, that the text generated by an AI trained on Victorian England end up sounding like the kinds of books from that period, uh, having some of the details of the world from that period, in which case um, they, they might be popular with people who lived in that period. And so they would be a good choice for intended audience. But if, if our corpus is sufficiently large and complicated, it might turn out that uh, it's hard to tell exactly who the intended audience should be because you might have text from various wildly different periods coming together to create a wholly new genre of fiction, in which case it might be really difficult to pinpoint who the intended audience should be. So the sort of the general summary here is that because AI written fiction would be generated without some intention or creative act on the part of the, the, the writer, um, a lot of theories of philosophy of fiction that put a big emphasis on the role of authorial intent will struggle and more reader focused accounts will do better. Uh, thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions.